Take your Bibles with me this morning and return to the book of Luke. Luke chapter number 1. Luke chapter number 1 this morning. I want to look again at some of the characters that make up the Christmas story. And today we'll be looking this morning service at the character by the name of Mary. And we understand that we know who Mary is. She is the mother of Jesus Christ. And let me just say, before we go any further into this message, I do not personally hold to the teaching that is out there in various religious groups that Mary is a deity like Jesus Christ, because I do not believe that she is. Uh, there are certain denominations that hold Mary up into an equal place as Jesus Christ, and I do not believe that Mary is anywhere close to being equal to Jesus Christ, but yet she was a very special person. She was a very special lady because she was the one that the Lord, that, that, that God himself chose to give the Jesus Christ seed through. And so I'm thankful for Mary, but I want to look at some of the things from which we can learn from studying and examining the life of Mary as we think about Christmas time that we're about to enter into. Look with me in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 26. Luke chapter 1, verse number 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth the Son, and, that, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be seen? I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before the throne of grace this morning, we'd ask now that the Spirit of God would take and anoint the reading and the study and the preaching of your word this morning. Father, may the Spirit of God impact the hearts of these that are here today. And Father, may you, through the example of Mary in Scripture, show us how our lives ought to be. Help us to demonstrate our lives according to the patterns that we find in the life of Mary. And Father, I pray that if there's one here today that is wayward, and Father, needs to come back to you, that, Father, you would convict them today. Father, you would challenge them today. But, Father, most importantly, you would make changes in their life this morning. Father, we love you. We're grateful for all that you do. We'd ask now that you would bless through the services. For it's in thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we begin to look at the mother of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary... There are some things that Mary teaches you and I that I believe are good help for you and I in the day and time in which we live in. There are some things that, that I saw in the life of Mary that I believe ought to be in the life of each and every one of us 
as God's people in today's time as well. I want you to see, first of all, that Mary teaches you and I about leaning on Jesus and His Word. And so as we study the life of Mary, we'll understand that she teaches you and I how to lean on Jesus Christ and how to lean on the very Word of God. And as we begin to study Mary, I want you to notice some things that we see here. Look with me at verse number 38 of the passage that we read. The Bible says, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You can imagine Mary's somewhat shock as here she is. She's engaged to Joseph. She is not even gone through the, the procedures to be married yet. She is just engaged. She is betrothed to Joseph. They have gone through that courtship phase. And an angel by the name of Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're going to have a son. And you can imagine Mary's utter disdain and utter shock as she responds to the angel and says, how can this be? I've never been with a man. I, I don't know a man. I mean, Joseph and I were, were dating, if you would. We've never done what needs to happen for a baby to be born. How can this be? And the angel says unto her, Mary, don't worry about the details that are surrounding it. The Holy Ghost is going to take care of all that. The Holy Ghost is going to do what he needs to do to make this event happen. And, and I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God works behind the scenes, if you would, in our lives, do, doing things that we don't often see. But Mary is somewhat shocked, but yet she responds to the angel with these words, be it unto me according to thy word. Here I believe is what Mary is saying. Mary is simply telling the angel this, I don't understand it, but I believe in it. Let me just say this morning that there are some things in the word of God that I just don't fully understand, but I believe it because God said it. Amen. There are some things in the word of God that have happened, some, some of, of the teachings of God that I just can't fully wrap my head around, that you and I as God's people can't fully grasp and get a complete, clear understanding of from the Word of God. But it doesn't matter, doesn't mean that it's not true, because if God said it, then it's true. And so there's this aspect of just simply leaning on God. If God tells you and I to do something, we ought to do it. Just take God at His Word. Trust God's Word. Believe the Word of God, knowing that the Word of God will never lead you astray. It will never lead me astray if I will just lean upon Jesus Christ and lean upon His Word. She took the angel at His Word. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter number 2, verse number 19. Luke chapter 2, verse number 19. This is the, one of the kind of the closing verse of the shepherds coming to see what had taken place. They, they made their way to the manger. They seen the baby, Jesus Christ. They began to tell Joseph and Mary all the events that took place as they were out in the field keeping watch over their flock. But I want you to notice what Mary's response was to what the shepherds had said in verse number 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I believe what that passage teaches you and I is that Mary took and she applied, she meditated, and she fully considered the Word of God. She considered it intently. She, in, she considered it uh, intimately. As she thought about the Word of God, she allowed the Word of God to go through her mind. She allowed the Word of God to go through her heart. And she kept those things. She pondered them. And she thought about them intently. I believe this morning that as God's people, we ought to think about the Word of God intently. Really considering the Word of God. Really thinking about the Word of God this morning. But Mary pondered 
and kept all those things that had happened in her heart. Look at Luke chapter number 2, verse number 51. Here Mary and Joseph have returned back to Jerusalem because after they had traveled away from Jerusalem, they realized that Jesus was not with them. You can imagine a mother's surprise when her son's not there. <laughs> I remember one time in my life, I got left at our church. This was when I was a baby. And uh, back in Amarillo, my, my dad thought my mom had me. My mom thought my dad had me. Neither one of them had me. I was still in the nursery. Thankfully, the nursery worker was kind enough to stay and didn't leave. But my mom and dad both got home. They walked in the house, and my mom goes, where's Eddie? Well, I thought you had him. No, I thought you had him. Neither one of them had me. I'm still back at the nursery, so they had to drive back to the church. You know, I'm thankful that they did come back and get me. And they didn't say, well, here's our opportunity. Someone else can have him now. It's someone else's problem now. They came back for me. Mary and Joseph returned to find Jesus. They find Jesus sitting, and he's questioning the scholars. He's questioning the lawyers. He's questioning the doctors. And, and the, the Bible says that they were astonished at his wisdom, a 12-year-old boy. And yet, when Mary finds him, she says, what are, you, what are you doing to us, son? We've been looking for you. We've been searching for you. And his response in verse number 49 is this. How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. She began to ponder what was going on. You know what she was doing is she realized she knew that this was the Son of God. And all the things that were taking place, all that was unfolding in her life, she began to consider. And she teaches you and I simply this. Just take God at His word. Believe the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Hear the word of God. Apply the word of God to our lives. Meditate upon it. Think about it. Look with me at Romans chapter number 12, verse number 8. Romans chapter, uh, I, I mean, did I say, I think I said 12, Romans 10. Romans 10, 8. <coughs> Romans chapter 10, verse number 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now, I do believe that we ought to consider, we ought to ponder, we ought to lean upon the preaching of the word of God. When an individual stands up behind a pulpit, whether it's myself, or any other end man that stands and, and preaches the word of God, we ought to listen intently with open ears and an open heart to glean from the message of the word of God, to take the word of God and apply it to our lives, hear the word of God, and not allow things to distract us, not allow things to keep us from being focused and centered on the Word of God. Because listen, the preaching is simply that. Preaching is being centered in the Word of God. If a preacher's worth anything, he's going to be preaching from this book. Amen. And he's going to keep it in this book. And so we ought to be gleaning from that, listening to it. Because the Bible says here, the Word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and also in thy heart. It's not just about having the, having the Word of God here. Sometimes we need to move it from the head to the heart. Getting it from up here to down here. See, you can have it up here and never do anything with it. Oh, but when it begins to affect the heart, then it will begin to affect the way you live. Affect the way you conduct yourself, the way you do things. Leaning 
upon the word of God. Hey, I can promise you that if you'll lean upon this King James Bible, it'll never lead you astray. It's never done you wrong yet, and I can promise you it'll never do you wrong in the future because it's the word of God. It's a true book. It's a good book this morning. Look with me at Psalms 119, verse number 11. Psalms 119, verse number 11. Very familiar passage of scripture to us as we simply think about Mary pondering the word of God, Mary taking the all that had happened, the, the, the word from the angel that came from God to her, the Bible said that she believed it, she applied it, she uh, pondered it, she thought about it. Notice what Psalms 119 verse number 11 says. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against God. Just simply pondering the Word of God. Letting the Word of God sink into your life. Letting the Word of God fill your soul. Letting the Word of God bless you and to move you in such a way that it will keep you from sin. Hey, when you began to read the Word of God, heed the Word of God, apply the Word of God, and hide the word of God in your heart. It will keep you and I from sin. That's how great this book is. This Bible. This book that we hold before us today. If we'll lean upon it. If we'll lean upon Jesus and his word. It will keep you and I out of living in sin. Not falling into sin. Look at Joshua chapter number 1. Verse number 8. Joshua chapter number 1. Verse number 8. you to notice that Joshua chapter number 1 verse number 8 is not just for, for a pastor it's not just for preachers this is for every Christian notice what is said in the book of Joshua this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Maybe, maybe you've dealt with people that they say, well, how can I be prosperous in life? How can I have good success in life? Well, the Bible tells us right here, apply the word of God, live the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Let me just say, if the only time that you and I are leaning on the Word of God is on Sunday morning when we're in church, we're not in the Word of God enough. If the only time we're getting the Word of God is Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon, we're still not getting the Word of God enough. If you're getting the Word of God only on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, and Wednesday night, supposing that you come to all of our services, and that's the only time in the week that you open up the Word of God, you're not getting the Word of God enough. Because our passage tells us that it ought to be in our hearts. We ought to meditate in the Word of God day and night, and it ought not to depart out of our mouth. We ought to be speaking it, we ought to live it, we ought to love it. I mean, our lives ought to be centered around the Bible. Amen. It ought to be centered in the Word of God. Mary teaches you and I about leaning on Jesus and His Word. Notice with me Proverbs chapter number 3. Proverbs chapter number 3. A lot of times when we come to Proverbs chapter number 3, we always want to focus on verses 5 and 6, where the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And so we, we understand that. And, and what great verses those are, are they not? Trust in the Lord with all, your, all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. But I want you to notice verse number 1. 
of Proverbs chapter number 3. As we jump back just a little bit, notice how the Holy Spirit opens the writing of Proverbs chapter number 3. He says, My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. He said, stay in the Word of God. Lean upon the Word of God. Stand upon the Word of God. Don't forget it. Keep it. Apply it. Live it. Why? For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You know one of the ways to add length unto your life? Heed the Word of God. You want to have a long life? Live the Word of God. Read it, study it, meditate upon it, hide it, and then practice it every day of your life. And the Lord says it'll give you a length of days. And it'll give you a long life. It'll give you peace when there is no peace. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and men. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You know what that passage is telling us is simply this. Don't lean on what you think is right. Lean upon what God has said is right. Lean upon the word of God. Lean upon Jesus Christ. Mary teaches us to lean upon Jesus. Mary teaches us to lean upon his word. Hey, I don't understand it, Mary. Mary says, I don't understand what you're talking about, Gabriel. I I can't fully comprehend it. But I'm going to trust you because you're an angel of the Lord. You've said this is God's word, so I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe it. See, Mary teaches us about leaning on Jesus and his word. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2. We looked at this just a few moments ago, but I want to read it now. Luke chapter 2. Look at verse number 41. Luke chapter 2, verse number 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem, Luke 2, 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his Mary knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The second thing that Mary teaches us out of this passage is this thought. Mary teaches you and I as God's people about the need to look for Jesus. The need to look for Jesus. Mary and Joseph have left Jerusalem after the, the after returning to do all the customs that went on there in Jerusalem. The custom of the feast and The Bible said that they had been gone a day's journey when they realized that, wait, something's missing. We're missing somebody. Where's he at? So they began to look through the crowd. And I, you know, I I anticipate that this probably wasn't a small crowd of people that they're looking through. These are probably thousands of people that they're having to search through trying to find Jesus Christ. And 
Man, they began to search and they began to look and they don't find him. They don't find him amongst their friends. They don't find him amongst their family. He's just nowhere to be found. So they return unto Jerusalem looking for him. The Bible said that after three days of looking, they finally, finally find Jesus Christ in the temple and asking questions and, and answering questions that are given to him. And everyone is just amazed at how brilliant this 12-year-old boy is. I mean, it's not like asking my 12-year-old boy some of the questions. <laughs> They'd be like, man, how dumb are these kids? No, not really. They're just amazed at how intelligent this young man is. Mary and Joseph finally find him. But they begin to look. They're looking. They're looking. They were looking. I don't believe that Mary and Joseph would have ever stopped looking for their son. They would have kept going and kept going and kept going. One of my favorite movies, it always comes out around this time. And I don't know why I like it so much. I don't know if it's the comedy aspect or if it's the fact that I see so much of my childhood in this little troublemaker. But I love the movies Home Alone. You know, I just love that movie. And in the second one, Home Alone, Lost in New York, you know, the, the, the kid ends up on the wrong plane. And he ends up in New York all alone. And he, he encounters the same bandits that he had encountered in the first movie. And, uh, but now he's on ground where he's not really familiar. He's not in his own house. But he ends up in the house of his aunt and uncle, and the, the house is being renovated. And so he gets the burglars to come there, and I mean, he does everything that he did in the first movie, if not worse this time, and, and to him just takes care of him. But there's a point in there where his mother returns from their vacation in Miami, ends up back in New York, and she is talking to a police officer. And she, she's beginning to ask the police officer if they have seen her son. And they ask her this question. They said, well, have you filed a, a police report, a missing persons report? And the cop, and she responds and says, yes, we've done all that. The cop responds and says, well, why don't you let us do our job then? The mother's response is this. He's my son, and I'm not going to stop looking for him. Let me just ask you this today. Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Then are we going to stop looking for him? No. We're going to keep looking. We're going to keep searching. We want to know everything there is to know about him. We want to keep focusing on him. We want to look for Jesus Christ. We want to see who he is. We want to get to know him in such a way. I'm not going to stop looking for Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep searching my Bible. I'm going to keep looking at who God is through his word. Look with me at Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. The Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 12, Verse number two, and I went too far uh, there. I'm back in, in James now. All my pages are sticking together. I'll get there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two, the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, I'm thankful today that he is the author. He is the one who wrote our faith. He is the one who finished our faith. Oh, I don't want to stop looking this morning for my Savior. I want to keep looking, looking for Jesus, looking for the Savior, and I want to keep pointing others to Jesus. I want them to keep looking for Jesus as well. Mary didn't stop until she found Jesus Christ. This world needs to keep looking until they find him. And then once they find him, they need to keep looking so that they can understand everything there is to know about him. So that we can grow in knowledge of Jesus Christ. We can grow because of what he has done for us. We ought to keep searching 
and keep studying, keep examining the Word of God so that we can know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ. Look with me at the book of Titus. The book of Titus, just a, a few chapters over from where we were, Titus, right before the book of Philemon, which is right before the book of Hebrews. Titus chapter number 2, look at verse number 13. Now that I'm saved, I've looked, you and I have looked, we've seen Jesus Christ, we've been saved, now we're looking for something else. Look at what Titus chapter number 2, verse number 13 tells us to look for. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, now we're looking for something else. We're looking for Jesus Christ to return. Amen. We're looking for Him to step out on that cloud, drop down, announce His uh, uh, announce his coming and then you and I which which are alive and you and I which are saved are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord see I'm looking, I'm waiting I'm anticipating because I know he's coming back pretty soon Amen. you might say well preacher how long I don't know <laughs> nor do you but I just know he's coming I know he's coming how can we know that he's coming? Well, because we lean upon his word. Because we believe his word. We know that he is truth. We know that what he said will come to pass. Well, preacher, I've been hearing that my whole life. Yeah, so have I. I'm 38 years of age, and I've been hearing that my whole life, that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It hasn't happened yet. Don't you grow discouraged? No. Because I know it is going to happen. I just don't know when. So what do, we, what do we do in the meantime? What do we do while we're waiting? Look up. Lift up your head. Look up. Look for Jesus to return. Live your life in such a way that if the Lord was to return today, he would be pleased with you. Because wouldn't that be an awkward situation if the Lord was returned today and you were caught doing something that is wrong? Wouldn't that be a... I mean, can you imagine that? Getting caught up. In a moment when you're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. See, looking, waiting, anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. Look at Luke chapter number 21. Luke chapter number 21. Look at verse number 25. Luke chapter 21, verse number 25. Luke 21, 25. Still here, still, still here pages roughly, so I'll wait and let you get there. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth. Distress of nations. Are we seeing that today? The distress of nations. With perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Notice verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear. We see that today. Fear is taking hold of individuals. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, hey, when nations begin to become in distress, when... Uh, the, there's earthquakes in divers places when all of this stuff begins to happen, when men's hearts begin to feel or fail them because of fear, the Bible says in verse number 28, when all these things come to pass, we're to do something. Look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. Draw it. See, Mary teaches you and I to look for Jesus. You may say, for a job looked and I found him. That's great. I'm glad you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Keep looking. Because now we're looking for him to return. We're looking for him to come back and call us unto himself. And then notice with me John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19. 
You say, preacher, you're getting further and further away from the Christmas story. I understand. <laughs> But we're talking about Mary. John chapter number 19. Look at verse number 25. Now there stood by, his, by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved also we know that to be John. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. As I thought about this, and as I just considered Mary, thinking about this character of Christmas, and how that she has impacted the Christmas story, she taught us first to lean upon God and His Word. She taught us secondly how to look for Jesus. And then I believe thirdly, she teaches us this. Mary teaches us how to fall in love with Jesus. How to be in love with Jesus. Say, preacher, how do you, how do you know Mary loved Jesus? Well, one, the Bible doesn't clearly say it here. I think it would take a great love for a mother to stand at the base of the cross where her son is now hanging. As Mary has stood, and I believe that she has witnessed the agony that her son has gone through, as she has seen the Roman soldiers begin to whip him, as she has seen the Roman soldiers take the crown of thorns and beat it into the brow of her very son, as she has witnessed the Roman soldiers begin to slap him, as she has witnessed the Roman soldiers begin to pluck the very beard out of his face, and the book of Isaiah tells us that all that he went through, that he went through so much that he wasn't even recognizable as a man. And here stood the very mother of Jesus Christ standing at the cross, perhaps bawling, weeping, as she see her son hanging there in agony and just dying for all of mankind. That's some love of a mother to stand there and witness that. Go on. Amen. But to think about the love that is demonstrated also from the cross for his mother as he began to look down upon his mother and he says, Mother, don't worry. I got somebody standing there beside you that I want you to fall in love with like you did me. His name is John. He says, John, I want you to take Mary. And I want you to take care of her. Do this for me. Make sure she's taken care of. I remember several years ago, our first year of being here, we got a call one day that Barbie's dad had had a heart attack, been taken to the hospital. We didn't know what was going to take place. Barbie jumped up and took off to the Metroplex. And I waited a few days. Headed out. I think she left on a Tuesday. I stayed here for the Wednesday night service, and then Thursday morning I headed to the Metroplex. I got there on my way to pick up some stuff from her mom and dad's house. They were planning to go into the nursing home. They were giving us some things. I made my way down there, and I was headed to the house. And Barbie called me. She said, "Eddie, you need to come to the hospital. They don't know if Dad's going to make it." So I did. While we were there that night, her dad looked over at Barbie and me and made this statement. He said, whatever happens to me, make sure you take care of your mother. A husband was concerned about his wife. Much like Jesus was concerned about his mother, I believe Mary was concerned about her son. And here she is standing at the 
cross of Jesus Christ in love with Jesus. Oh, she teaches us about the need to fall in love with God. Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse number 5, gives us one of the gives us the greatest commandment known to the Christian. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 5. The Bible says this to you and I. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. I truly feel today that the problem that the Christian has, that, that, the, that the problem that Christians struggle with the most is this very thing. I think we've fallen out of love with Jesus. We've fallen out of love with God. The Bible says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And with all thy might. I believe if we would just fall back in love with God over again, it would change us. It would change us. It would change who we are. It would shake us to the very core. Oh, if you and I, as God's people, would just fall back in love with Jesus Christ. Over in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, the first couple of chapters are written to seven different churches there in Asia. The very last church that is written to is the church of Laodicea. The Lord has a scolding that he gives to them, and the scolding was this. He, he gets on to them because they had left their first love. You know what they had done? They had left God out of the picture. They left God out. They turned against God. We don't need God anymore. We can do our own thing. Oh, I don't need God to build my church. I can do it my own way. I can just compromise the Word of God. I can compromise my stand on music. I can change my dress standards. I can get rid of the pulpit and go to something else, and I can draw in a greater crowd. Oh, yeah, you can do all that, but I want to stay true to the Word of God. I want to stay in love with Jesus Christ and do it God's way. Build according to the way God says. Oh, that we might just love the Lord thy God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. You know what that simply tells me this morning is love God with every ounce of your being. Amen. You are to just be so in love with God that, that nothing else matters to you. Just your relationship with God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 7, verse number 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God. The faithful God. Aren't you thankful this morning that God's been faithful? Yes. Amen. Even in spite of our unfaithfulness, God has always been faithful to you and I. He has never not been faithful to us because He is the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Notice that. It's not just about loving Him. It's about keeping His commandments. Look at Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23 this morning. Joshua chapter 23. Look at verse 11. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Take heed, Christian. Take heed, church member. Take heed, child of God, that ye love the Lord your God. Always make sure you're in love with God. Make sure you're in love with Jesus Christ. Look with me at Matthew chapter 22. 
You might say, preacher, that's in the Old Testament. I understand. Look with me in Matthew. Jesus taught this very same principle time and time again in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 37. The Bible says, verse 35 tells us, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? He's thinking about the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord like well, I still believe that the first one is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord like God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And he begins to tell him that. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law. And the prophets. Hey, the whole word of God situates around two commandments. Love God, love people. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then love thy neighbor as thyself. Hey, if we could just learn to do those two things. Our relationship with people would be what they ought to be if we would first learn to be in love with God the way that we should be. If I would just learn to fall in love with God all over again and be in love with God the way that I need to be, I wouldn't have to, my relationships would somewhat work themselves out because God would make sure of it. Loving God the way that we ought to. Look at 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. here. 1 John 2, look at verse 15 with me. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Christian, we cannot love God and also love the world. We, we will never be in love with God the way that we're supposed to if there's still a desire for the things of the world. We have to change, change the, the, the love of the world for the things of the love of God. We have to get rid of what used to we used to like. I hear Christians that I talk to. They'll make statements like this. Well, I love God, but I don't love the church. Then you don't love God if you don't love the church. Because the Bible says that God loved the church and gave himself for it. Amen. A person cannot be in love with God and despise and hate the church. You just can't do it. Because the Bible says that he, he loved it and he gave himself for it. God loves the church today. And so if we're going to love God the way that we're supposed to, then we have to love the church. God loves people. God also, let me just say this, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. We've got to get to that place in our lives where we begin to love people the way that we should. Oftentimes, we'll develop a hatred for a certain class of people because of something that they did. I can remember back on September the 11th of 2001 that this world began to, to hate Muslims because of a few that did the terror on the World Trade Centers and the, the Pentagon. And, and there were Christians that just began to hate people because they were of the Muslim faith. Hey, it's not just the faith that does it for people. It's the heart. 
within the man. I still love the people. They need to know Jesus Christ. I know of people today that hate black people with a passion. White people that hate black people. I preached in a church once. that They questioned me about that. And I had this statement made to me. They said, they said, Brother Sutton, if you come to this church, you cannot under any circumstances let a black person join. I looked at them and I said, take my name out of the hat. I'm not coming back. You know what they had? They had a hate for a specific person. That's not taught in Scripture. We can't be in love with God and be right with God and hate somebody because of their skin color. I can't be in love with God and hate somebody because of what, na of what nation that they come from. Just because somebody comes from Iran or somebody comes from Iraq does not make them a bad person. Just... Just because a person grew up in the United States of America doesn't make them a, a good person or a bad person. Exactly. It's not about our skin. It's about our relationship with Jesus Christ. See, we've gotten so wrapped up in this idea that we can hate people. If we hate people, then we're not in love with God the way that we should. Because when we start developing prejudices against somebody, we have fallen out of love with God. Because the Bible says that God, for God so loved the world Amen. that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hey, if we don't fall in love with the things that God loves, we're not right with him. See, Mary teaches us to trust God, lean upon his word. Mary teaches us to look for Jesus. And then Mary teaches us about how it is to love Jesus. Oh, Mary loved him all the way to the cross. She stood by him as he gave his life for us. Let me ask you and close with this statement. Do you love Jesus this morning? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? Or is there room for improvement in your life? Do you love people the way that you should? Do we love the church the way that we should? Do we love the Word of God the way that we should? Are you looking for Jesus' return? Oh, what a day that's going to be when we hear that trumpet sound. And we look up, and there stands Jesus on the cloud with his angels surrounding him. And you and I are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then, Christian, let me encourage you. Lean upon his word. Believe his word. Accept his word. Apply his word in your life today. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Father, I thank you for the preaching of your word today. Father, I pray that you would impact lives this morning. Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would convict as only you can. Father, I pray that you would challenge as only you can. And Father, I pray that you would change as only you can. Father, we love you. We are so grateful to you for all that you do in our lives. Father, bless this invitation time. For it's in thy name we pray. Amen.